morning, church. Bring greetings from the flat, windy state of Nebraska. Um, in case you didn't know, that's not where I was born and raised. I was born and raised right here in Chicago. I actually could probably throw a rock and hit the house that I grew up in. Um, you'd have to have a pretty good arm, but if you do, then the Cubs, I'm sure, would want to sign you up to pitch for them next year. But uh, again, it's a great privilege uh, to be here this morning before you all to uh, bring you God's word. I'd like to think, I don't know if people look down from heaven. I mean, I would like to think that they're too busy gazing in the beautiful face of Christ in the afterlife. But uh, if, if he were, I, I would like to think that uh, my dad were looking down here uh, this morning. So I'm going to try to do this without turning into a blubbery mess this morning. So if you will, please. Uh, take your Bibles and turn in them to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. In my Bible, that's page 1096. I don't know if that helps you at all, but... I didn't realize this was your anniversary Sunday, so it's also a great privilege to uh, celebrate with you God's uh, outrageous grace and uh, preserving and and uh, his through his providence to bring this church through 132 years, um, you know as Pastor Dustin was mentioning earlier, it truly is God that did this, right? Because if you think about it, what does Paul say in First Corinthians chapter one? It is the message of the cross that we bring is foolish, right, to the world. It, it is it is a scandal to the Jew and it's foolish to the to the Gentile, and yet. It is the wisdom of God that we proclaim. It is the wisdom of God that we show forth. And it is God who then uses the foolishness of the preached word to bring to nothing the wisdom of men, to bring to nothing the strength of men. So it is, again, a great privilege to bring you God's word this morning. Uh, before I read God's word, I would like to uh, ask for his blessing on our time this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, as... We are celebrating the 132 years of faithfulness that you've shown to this church. Lord, your grace and your mercy that each and every one of us here this morning are a recipient of that legacy of grace that you have bestowed upon this location. We pray, Lord, for your continued providence and grace and mercy should you tarry. Pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless the ministry of this church, that you'll bless the ministry of Pastor Moore and the other pastors here, that you will continue to shine the light of the gospel to a dark and dying world. And Lord, now we come before you to hear your word read and proclaimed this morning. I pray for myself as your servant that you will give me the strength of your Holy Spirit to proclaim your word in all of its truth. Pray, Lord, for open ears and open hearts to receive the preached word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. So please give your attention here as I read God's word to you this morning. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? When she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, that repenteth. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, 
Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great, great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friend. As soon as this son, this thy son, was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So I titled this message, Outrageous Grace, because the title Amazing Grace has already been taken. I didn't want to, I guess it is public domain, so I suppose I could use it, but I think what you see here is a story of outrageous grace, the outrageous grace of Christ towards sinners depicted in these three parables that we see before us this morning. But just a couple of questions. I'd like to ask before we begin first, are we still amazed by grace? Does grace still grip your heart? Are you still amazed when you see sinners come to repentance, people that you thought would probably never come to faith, people maybe in your heart of hearts you think should never come to faith? Are we still amazed by grace? Do we take grace for granted? We seem to live in a in an atmosphere of God's grace day after day, do we take grace for granted? Are we like the friends of Job who, when Job was suffering, said to him, you must have done some kind of sin. And Job essentially said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Do we, as the Pharisees here, murmur in our hearts when we see someone whose life does not exhibit anything that we would consider of Christian character, come to faith. Because that's what you see here in this passage this morning. Uh, you're going to see here murmuring, grumbling. In fact, the word murmur sounds like what they would be doing, murmur, murmur, right? You know, it's kind of what they call, and you remember from uh, grade school English, an onomatopoeia, which doesn't sound anything like, you know, murmuring. But anyway, it, they, they're murmuring. And why are they murmuring? They're murmuring because... The scribes and the Pharisees see Jesus hanging out with publicans and sinners. You know, if you know anything about publicans, right, those are people that would have been considered the traitors of that day, right? They were, they were the people whom the Jews thought of as 
selling out to Rome because they were the ones collecting taxes from Rome. And of course, the sinners would be the people that were considered outcasts, people who were not considered worthy uh, to come into uh, worship in the community. Now, the context of Luke 15, really, if you want to really think about it, it begins all the way back in chapter 9, verse 51. There, Jesus begins his trek toward Jerusalem. It says in chapter 9, verse 51, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Here it is, in, is at least in the way that Luke tells his gospel, Jesus is now moving on toward that appointment, that divine appointment that he has at the cross in Jerusalem. He knows what the work he has to do, and he's going now. He has steadfastly set his face to do the work, the atoning work of dying on the cross. And he's moving now toward Jerusalem. And then in Luke chapter 14, he stops and he has supper. You have to say supper in Nebraska. For us, it's dinner. For them, it's supper. And if you say dinner, they think a completely different meal. But he has supper here with one of the Pharisees. He comes into his home and he eats with them. And then he begins to do something that, that uh, you, know, you don't do uh, to a in front of a Pharisee, and that is you work on the Sabbath. He heals a man on the Sabbath, and it causes them to, to think and murmur. They begin to murmur in their hearts. And then Jesus does, he gives some teaching there. And as he's giving this teaching, then you start to see the publicans and the tax collectors and the, and the sinners, they start to approach Jesus. Why are they approaching Jesus? Because he is speaking in a way that is unlike the way the Pharisees spoke. And they are, they are drawing near because their souls are hungry for the truth that Jesus is bringing. Their souls are, are longing for this outrageous grace. So as we look at this passage, I want us to see sort of an overarching theme is that God shows outrageous grace in seeking and saving the lost. God shows outrageous grace in seeking and saving the lost. Now, I'm not going to step through all of the parables verse by verse. I am, what I'm doing, though, is I'm going to group this passage into three sections. And I'm going to deal with each of the characters, because each of these three parables has three main characters. You've got something that is lost. You've got someone who seeks the lost thing. And then you've got the rest, the rest of the things that aren't lost. So like in the parable of the sheep, you've got 99, you've got, you've got one sheep that gets lost, you've got the shepherd who searches for him, and then 90 and 9 sheep that are not lost. Or one lost coin, a woman who searches, and then the 10 or the 9 remaining coins. And of course you've got the three sons, the lost son, the older son, and then the father. So we're going to look at first the lost, the, the sheep, the coin, the younger son. Now, it's clear from the context when Jesus tells these parables that he is using the concept of the lost thing to represent the publicans and the sinners who are gathering to Jesus. These are the lost things. These are the people that Jesus was accused of receiving and, and that the Pharisees were murmuring when they came to Jesus. They are lost. There is the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost younger son. And, and they're lost because sheep wander, right? Uh, if you know anything about sheep, sheep like to wander. In fact, I remember seeing a sort of like a little YouTube video clip of a sheep that was stuck in a ditch. You got two or three guys sitting there trying to help the sheep up. And once the sheep gets out, he's so excited he runs and falls in the ditch like 10 feet later. Sheep wander. Coins get lost, right? You should know this if you were to dig under your couch, you'd probably find 10 years worth of lost coins that are all there. And of course, sons disappoint. They wander. Now you can ask the question, why are they lost? Well, they're lost because they're sinners, right? I mean, that, that, that's, we're all sinners, right? Before coming to Christ, we're all lost. We're all in darkness. We're all, we all have that veil before our eyes to uh, keep us from knowing the truth. And, and so you could say, well, they're sinners. They're born in sin, so by definition, they're lost. But it's a little deeper than that, right? These are the lost sheep of Israel, right? These are people of the covenant community of Israel. They are 
the, the, the publicans and the sinners. They are the people that the Pharisees should have been shepherding. These are the people that the Pharisees should have been caring for. They are fellow Jews. They are members of the community. So they're lost because they're considered outcasts. They're lost because, at least in the eyes of the Pharisees, they are not worthy to be included in their community. They're lost because the scribes and the Pharisees didn't care for them. They, they laid on them burdensome rules, man-made traditions that left them feeling lost and discouraged and disconnected. Think of what Jesus says in Matthew, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, when he says, Come unto me, all you who are heavy burdened and, and weary. What are they weary from? What are they heavy burdened with? The laws and the rules and the traditions that the Pharisees and scribes had placed on them. They have been beaten down by the rules. And Jesus says, Come unto me. Take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. They're lost because they see God as unloving and uncaring. And the Pharisees did nothing to, to dissuade them of this, this, this mindset, of this view. Consider the younger son here again in verses 11 and following, where you see here Jesus tells the parable, he says, and a, man had a, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. The younger son felt as if the father was kind of a, a, a harsh taskmaster, and he wanted to be free from that. He wanted to be away from that. He wanted to be out from under the, the, the roof of his father. Jesus calls us the church because perhaps, you know, maybe you've been in a church before, not this church, but maybe you've been in another church. Maybe you felt lost in your church. Maybe you felt as if, you know, I, I, I come to, to hear the gospel, but all I hear are burdensome rules. All I hear are, you know, you're not like us. You don't look like us. You don't sound like us. You don't talk like us. You don't dress like us. Maybe you're lost in the church. The son felt lost at home. He wanted to be out from under the Father. What does Jesus call us to do? He calls us, the church, to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We are to go out and we are to season the world with, with, our, with the love that we have that Christ has given us. We are to go out and bring that light to a dark world. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Verses 13 and 16, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Beloved, the world sees God in Jesus through us. Right? We are, because Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty right now, we are what the world sees, and we are how the world sees God in Christ. Do we need a refresher course on how lost we once were before Christ? Do we need a Refresher course on the grace, the outrageous grace that Christ has shown to us. That's the loss. Let's now look at the seeker because here, I think what you see are the most outrageous parts of these parables that Jesus tells. And it's the actions of the seeker. Because what you have here is you have a shepherd who leaves 99 perfectly good and healthy sheep out in the wilderness to go seek one sheep. Or you see a woman tear her house apart looking for that one lost coin, even though she still has nine perfectly good coins in her purse. We see here the father agree to liquidate his fortune in order to give the younger portion, the younger son his portion. You have to understand, right? I mean, the man was wealthy, but he wasn't wealthy like we, we are, right? Where you can go and just write a check and say, here you go, off you go, don't let the door hit you on the backside on the way out. He, had, he was probably wealthy in land, wealthy in livestock. What do you have to do? He's like, You're not going to give the younger son one-third of the sheep and he's going to leave town with a small petting zoo behind him. You've got to liquidate this. You've got to sell this. That requires a lot of effort. That's outrageous. 
fact, I would imagine the Pharisees hearing this parable would have kind of lost it at, at how the Father acts in this parable. We see the shepherd leave 99 perfectly healthy sheep, the woman tear her house apart for a coin, the father outrageously liquidating his fortune to give the younger son his portion. Why is this outrageous? Because these actions of the seeker at best seem careless. And at worst, they seem obsessive or, or reckless. Now, if the lost are the publicans and the sinners and the tax collectors who are coming to Jesus, who does the seeker represent? Well, that's God, right? Again, this is not exactly rocket science. God is the seeker. That much is clear. And what we see here in this parable is the heart of the Father. This, these parables show the heart of God toward sinners, toward the lost, toward lost things. Far from being harsh and, and burdensome, God leaves 99 to go seek one. He leaves nine coins to go seek one. These are outrageous, but the seeker is God. It should both encourage us, right? Because again, we were all lost before coming to Christ. And God sought us. He sought us, he hounded us down, he wore us down, and then brought us into the fold. That's, it should encourage us, but it also should convict us. Because then we should have that same heart toward others outside of the walls of this church. Now, the rabbis would have taught that, of course, God would receive a sinner as long as that sinner repents and does uh, works of contrition. If you show yourself to be uh, uh, sort of repentant enough, contrite enough, then maybe God would receive you back. In other words, it's saying you must do something first in order to earn God's approval and love. But what did we learn earlier, right? What did we learn earlier when we were looking at the, you know, the lesson? You know, is there, are we saved by anything we do? No. We are saved by nothing we do. You cannot be repentant enough. You cannot be contrite enough to earn God's love and approval. We earn God's love and approval through our faith in Christ because he was enough. Because he did enough for us. So the Pharisees would have taught that, yes, if you are show yourself to be contrite enough, then maybe God will receive you. But that's not the picture you see in these parables, right? You don't see the, the shepherd waiting for the sheep saying, well, it's about time you came back, right? Or the woman, you know, of course, I'm not sure how a lost coin would turn up unless you go search for it, but notice here, but the actions of the father. The actions of the Father as he actively seeks the lost. He doesn't wait for the Son to come back. He goes out and seeks them. Look at the Father's actions starting in verse 20. This is after the Son has his little crisis moment where uh, he was feeding the sheep and or feeding the pigs and then desiring to eat what the pigs ate. And then he has this little moment where he says, I'm going to go back to my Father. Right? All of a sudden now, what I thought was a harsh living environment is no longer so harsh now that I'm in the pigsty longing to eat what the pigs eat. It seems pretty good to have been back in my father's house, right? I remember the servants even had enough to eat and, and, and had leftovers. Then the son makes this little uh, kind of repentant speech where he's going to go to the father and says, look, I'm not worthy to be your son. Let, make me as one of your servants. Let me earn my way back in. Again, notice the grace here. We're going to get to it in a moment, but isn't that how we think, right? We sin and we're like, God, let me earn my way back into your favor. Let me earn my way back into your grace. Remember, you cannot do enough to get God's grace. It is already given to you in Christ. So now in verse, we'll pick it up in verse 20. And he arose, this is the younger son, and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, as he's giving his little speech now, Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the 
father said unto his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again, is lost and is found. And he began to be merry. What's outrageous in this is that when the father, who apparently was out there looking for his son, day and night, hoping the son would come back, looking out over the distance saying, where is my son? Where is my son? And when he sees him, does he wait for the son to come to him? No. Runs out to him. Runs out to him. He would have to, like, hike up his little man's skirt and run out to see his son. And he falls on him. Kisses him. And he doesn't even let him finish his speech. He says, bring the robe, bring a ring, bring shoes. Let us be merry, for my son is alive. Consider arguably the most popular verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave his only son. Or if you will, turn to Romans if you are so inclined. Romans chapter 5. Chapter 5, starting at verse 6. We all know this passage. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for a venture, for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that what while we were cleaned up and how we, we worked up enough uh, repentance, that we've done enough good works, we no. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. Verse 10, for if we were, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God doesn't wait for us to clean up our act. He comes to us when we were enemies. He sent his son to us while we were at our worst. When we were at our worst, God gave us his absolute best. Why does God seek the lost? Because he knows we won't seek him unless and until he first seeks us. Wandering sheep don't return. Lost coins don't magically appear. God seeks the lost out of a heart of love, out of a heart of mercy, out of a heart of grace, out of a heart of promise all of which is clearly seen in the ministry of Jesus. Ezekiel 34, the prophet there talks about the shepherds of Israel, how they were to care for the sheep, yet they didn't. They abused the sheep. And then he says in Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 16, I'm going to send you a shepherd. I'm going to be your shepherd. And I will gather you from all the places. And I will care for you. And John then, in Jesus, in John's gospel, picks up on this. When he says, what? I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. Every single one of us who believe in the gospel and love Jesus Christ are here because Jesus sought us out. He called us. He searched for us. He cared for us. He died for us. Now finally, let's look at the rest. 99 sheep, 9 coins, and a golden son. Because there's one more character in these parables, and that's the rest, right? If the, if the 99 sheep and the younger son are the sinners and the tax collectors, and the seeker is God, then who are the rest? Or be the scribes and the Pharisees. In fact, this parable is for them, right? Look again at verse 3 of chapter 15. And he spake this parable unto them the Pharisees and the scribes. This is for their benefit, right? Even though the publicans and the, and the sinners are there gathered at the feet of Jesus, Jesus tells us these parables to them, to the Pharisees, so that they can hear this. What are they doing? They're murmuring. They're murmuring. 
They don't see Jesus as showing us the heart of God towards sinners. They see Jesus as one who socializes with sinners. Right? What did they call him in the other Gospels? You are a wine biber and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a sinner because you hang out with them, right? Jesus sees Pharisees and the scribes as 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Yet, we know that from Luke's Gospel in chapter 5, when he has the feast at Levi's house, he says they... Those who are sick do not need, uh, those who are well do not need a doctor, but they don't realize the fact that they are in need of a great of a doctor. They are not righteous in the sense that they're perfect. They're not righteous in the sense that they are somehow accepted by God. They are self-righteous is what they are. They are righteous in their own works. Look at the older son in verses 25 and following party going on in the house, whereas the older son, he's out in the field. Now the elder son was in the field, and as he came, he drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, My brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath perceived him safe and sound. He was angry. He murmured. He would not go in. Therefore came, out, came his father out and entreated him. He answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. His father said unto him, Son, thou art with me, ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. Was lost and is found. The older son is angry. The older son is angry because he looks at his service, right? That's what the heart of self righteousness is, right? You look at what you've done. You look at your scorecard. You see how many boxes you've checked off. You see how many things you've done on the list of things to do today. And he looks, and when he sees the outrageous grace of his father toward his younger son, he doesn't rejoice. Even though the angels of heaven are rejoicing when one sinner repents, he's angry. He's angry. He sees his service to the Father as slavery. That word there where he says, I served thee many years, could be translated, I slaved for you. He doesn't serve his Father out of love. He doesn't serve his Father out of respect. He serves his Father out of fear. And he serves his Father out of what he can get for it. The son went away to a faraway country, yet the older son, all this time, while he's working in his father's house, is already in a faraway country in his heart. He's locationally close, but relationally he's far away. Notice the outrageous grace of the father. What does the father do? Again, remember, the father seeks to save the lost. He goes out toward the son. The younger son, or the older son, is lost. He's just as lost as the younger son. Even though he's in the house, even though he's serving him, he's lost because he doesn't see the grace of God. God has to go out to him. The father goes out to the older son and he entreats him. He begs with him, Come, join the celebration. Your son, your brother is home. Notice that the older son does not even refer to his brother as his brother. He says, this thy son. If you have more than one, if you have kids, you probably know this, right? If you go to your spouse and you say, have you, you know what your son has done? You know what your daughter has done? Like, it's your son and your daughter too. Yeah, when they do something wrong, that's all of a sudden, that's your son and your daughter. That's what the older brother is doing here, but in a more sinister way. He's like, this son of yours has wasted your living. The son of yours has, has wasted your living on harlots. Why are you bringing him back in? I have served you so many years, yet you never killed a fat goat for me. Outrageous grace. The father goes out toward the older son. Again, remember these parables are for the benefit of the scribes and Pharisees. He's telling them, the people that you are murmuring about, 
these are the people the Father is going to use. And I'm glad we have that. Won't you join us? Won't you join in the celebration? Who are we? Because oftentimes the parables are told so we can kind of point ourselves and find ourselves in the parable. Who are we? Are we the older son? Murmurs when we see the grace of God being shown to sinners? Are you a younger son? Perhaps you're in a faraway country and, and, and you're living in, in, in sin and you need to repent and come to the Father. Or maybe like many of us, myself included, maybe we we're, were at one time younger sons who have now become older sons as we've kind of you know, lived in this atmosphere of grace for so long we begin to take it for granted and then we don't want to show the same grace that we ourselves have been shown. Grace for us, justice for others. Who are we? Jesus said the world would know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. That's how the, that's how the world will see that we are the disciples of Christ. If we show not only love for one another here in the church, but love outside of the walls of this church to the enemies, to the Pharisees, and to the publicans and the sinners outside in the world today. find yourself with your love growing cold, which it can do, it does, right? Let's, let's, let's face it. Love does grow cold from time to time, right? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus here in these parables. Remember his love toward you. Remember the fact that Jesus, when he saw you afar off, ran to you and fell upon your neck and kissed you, and then put his robe of righteousness on you so you can stand righteous before God the Father. Not in the righteousness of our own, but one that comes by faith in Christ. Remember his outrageous grace to you. Now, we bring this to a close. Notice how the parable ends in verse 32. It kind of ends on a cliffhanger, right? You see the father entreat the son, the older son, but you don't hear the response of the older son. Why? Because he's waiting for the response from the Pharisees and the scribes. He told this parable to them. How are they going to respond? Jesus tells these three parables for their benefit who are, to the Pharisees and scribes who are grumbling and murmuring at the outrageous grace of Jesus in receiving sinners to himself. Will they join in the celebration with the angels of heaven when a sinner repents? These parables are for us too. They are a reminder, again, of the outrageous grace of God toward us because we too were in a faraway country. The Father sought for us and ran for us and received us with open arms. You ever have a child come up to you and say, Mommy, Daddy, how much do you love me? And you say, I love you this much. Right? And you say, only that much? Well, you know, if I could stretch my arms out further, I would. And you go up to Jesus and say, how much do you love me, Jesus? He says, I love you this much. I was so far off. I love you this much. Let us show the same outrageous grace toward others because the believer is not the enemy. They are the mission field. But more importantly, where is Jesus in all of this? We see the sinners. We see the Pharisees. We see the Father as the seeker. Where is Jesus in all of these parables? I would submit to you that Jesus is the better older brother. The older son, what should the older son have done when the younger son left the house? The older son should have gone up to the father and said, Father, I will go get your son. I will leave the house and I will go and retrieve him and bring him back to you. That's what the Pharisees should have done. They were the shepherds of Israel. They should have cared for the sheep. These people were washed sheep of Israel, and they did not care for them. Jesus did what the Pharisees and the scribes did not do. Jesus left the glories of heaven. He left the glories of being at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. As John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, the Word became flesh. God entered our time and space existence by taking on human flesh and dwelling among us. 
who came on a divine rescue mission which led to the cross. Remember, Jesus steadfastly set his face to go toward Jerusalem. Jesus comes to seek and save the lost. That is outrageous grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what grace you show to us sinners who deserve nothing but wrath, eternal hell, yet your love for us caused you to send your Son into the world to die for us. And Jesus receives us with open arms. Unlike the older brother in the story, he is the better older brother who came and sought us out, and brings us home, adopts us into the family. So Lord, we can now share joy and celebration in heaven over sinners who repent. Pray, O oh Lord, that we will never grow cold 